Authorities here are hoping Omicron will be the final huddle before our transition into a new normal. For more on this hope and related efforts, I have Professor Kim Mungyu from Yonsei University. Professor Kim, it's good to see you again. Thank you for having me. I also have Professor David Kwak from Sunchang University. It's always a pleasure to have you here, Professor Kwak. Good afternoon, Sunny. Right, Professor Kim, authorities believe the daily tally may hit as high as 170,000 by late this month. Do you agree? I think now we are facing the uh, real uh, face of Omicron right now. And uh, I regret, I regard this uh, emergence of Omicron uh, should be dealt as a totally new phase of this pandemic. And uh, I think we have to for forget about the uh, COVID-19 of Wuhan strain, and uh, this is Omicron. I, will, I think we can name it as uh, COVID-21 or something. Uh, now everyone is tired, and, uh, but there should be no false pre-assumption regarding Omicron uh, is the end of this uh, pandemic. Uh, th there's no way to know Omicron is going to be the start of endemicity. Uh, only high level of immunity of total population is the uh, strongest force toward uh, endemicity. And uh, there are some things we have to uh, be careful. I think uh, human behavior can change the course of this uh, uh, situation. And we have to correct something like uh, vaccine refusal. And maybe somebody will not to wear a mask, but still we have to do that. And uh, <coughs> politics-oriented uh, mentality is something we have to correct. And also, uh, as the situation is so there, I think uh, we have also may think that economy first policy, but I think we have to rethink about that. And uh, still, we need a, a mature citizenship and uh, a good leadership to overcome this situation. Right, we do. Professor Kwak, authorities on Monday also revealed that the COVID-19 test positivity rate had hit 26%, meaning one out of every four COVID-19 tests had been positive. What are your thoughts on this finding? Well, I think there would be multiples of factors that uh, affected the, the outcome uh, that we're finding. Uh, number one, uh, we have changed the method of testing so that only six people who are 60 years and above would be tested through RT-PCR automatically, but for those who are below that, would be tested through rapid antigen test, as you've seen on the screen first. And those who test positive from those will be given the RT-PCR testing, making the, the, uh, the containment of the RT-PCR testing more efficient, which would also mean that they would find higher confirmatory percentage in, in the results because those people who are more likely to be positive are only being tested with RT-PCR now. Also, the fact that we just overcame the, the holiday season over the past weekend or so would have drastically increased the chances of people being exposed to the virus itself, also increasing the chances that they are positive from the infection. So I think multiples of factors are um, really affecting the numbers, but also at the same time, as uh, Professor Kim already mentioned, we are seeing a very huge peak, uh, not peak, but very steep rise in the, the numbers. So the confirmation cases itself is really drastically rising, even though we're counting barely in around 30 to 40,000 uh, confirmation, uh, confirmation cases. I kind of uh, anticipate that we would, were um, actually uh, should be seeing around 60 to 70,000 possible cases uh, because not all of the people who sh are suspected of having the disease are currently being tested. So if that is so, that would also uh, count into the 20% of the confirmation cases that we are seeing. So the case itself, the infection itself, itself is uh, spreading and transmitting very fast. And it's really taking up the space in the, in the population itself. So I think it's just being represented more efficiently, but also at the same time numerically. Right, I see. Professor Kim, on a slightly reassuring note, however, the number of severely ill patients and fatalities has been retreating. Do you believe this trend will continue even as we continue to see an alarming surge in daily cases? Uh, I think we have ample reason to believe that way because the fatality of Omicron is only 0.16% compared to 0.8% of the Delta variant. But uh, as Professor Kwang mentioned, total confirmed cases are increasing unprecedentedly. And uh, 
Also, the reinfection of patients with pro previous COVID-19 is about five times if you're exposed to uh, Omicron compared to Delta. Uh, it's uh, data from Mayo Clinic. And uh, so it is clear the number of severe cases is, is going to rise uh, as we have seen in USA or UK or Israel, other countries. Thankfully, the ICU beds are less than 20% occupied right now. So that's a good news. But yeah, the total number is going to rise and it's going to be like that for a while. So uh, uh, we have to prepare for that situation. Right. Professor Kwok, as Professor Kim mentioned, Israel, it's been a global leader in vaccine rollout. But despite that, the number of critical cases there and that of COVID-19 deaths have been on an upward trend in recent days. How do you explain this phenomenon over in Israel? Well, it's very statistical. Um, so this actually matches to the cases happening in the U.S. when they found uh, over the, the uh, doubling of um, um, uh, admission rates among children with COVID-19, they actually found the children being admitted out of all those cases who are confirmed of the disease were actually lower than before. And I uh, traced back to Israel's case where they went from anything be, uh, around 400 of the daily confirmation cases and it's steeply raised up to about 80,000 per day or per weekly. Now, having said that the CFR, the case fatality ratio, and I must emphasize this is not entirely the correct or most accurate representation of what's happening, but still it's a good measure to um, follow uh, on these cases because it shows us really what's happening uh, uh, in regards to the severity of the disease uh, among those who are infected in the actual numbers. The CFR rate actually hung around about 0.4% in Israel usually before the Omicron hit, and it actually went down to 0 03 uh, uh, when the numbers of cases of death and also ICU bed units increased drastically. And this is only up to about January 26, so it may even rise further back up. But uh, still going back to the original topic, I think uh, the number that's uh, taking up spaces in ICU beds is very likely to happen to us as well. But the number itself does not uh, completely represent the severity or the direness of the disease from the Omicron. As also we have seen from the child, uh, children cases in the U.S. because when they mentioned that they were taking up uh, double the spaces that they used to, their rate of admission was actually a half to a third about what's happened what's been happening before ratio-wise. So we, as uh, Professor Kim mentions, mentioned again, uh, uh, we in the near future, in about a week of time or a couple of weeks, we should also expect to see the, uh, the numbers actually go up in the ICU capacity, uh, and we should prepare our, ourselves for that as well. Right. Professor Kim, back here in Korea, a new contact tracing system has been introduced as of this past Monday with COVID-19 patients being asked to voluntarily submit related information which will not be cross-checked by authorities. What do you suppose has prompted this shift in strategy and how does it look to affect this latest resurgence in COVID-19 cases here in the country? Uh, I had a phone call on the way to the studio and uh, one of my uh, uh, friends got infected and he was angry that nobody is interested in him. No, he had no phone call from anybody. But that's the situation right now. It just announced and uh, a lot of people do not understand uh, what is happening. So. Uh, we are doing this because Omicron is beyond our capacity to deal with. And our government seems to learn very fast from other countries suffering from Omicron outbreak. And uh, if we say the, uh, talk about the uh, data from USA, uh, they compare the uh, outbreak of the uh, 2021 winter time to this one. And uh, Omicron caused about four times of cases and two times of admission and 1.5 times of mortality is rising like uh, exponentially. But uh, <coughs> uh, that's the reason why uh, we can no longer con control this outbreak by tracing and testing and etc. So uh, there are multiple factors affecting this outbreak. And uh, first of all, the human factor, uh, we have to be honest about uh, our symptoms. So. Uh, you, you have to announce any kind of uh, symptoms you have. And uh, the government factor, I think we need more efforts uh, to publicly announce what is changing. 
And uh, if it doesn't work out, we, we have to upgrade and uh, make it work out uh, as much as we can. Right. Professor Kwok, there's also been a change in the treatment of COVID-19 patients at home, of course. Those who are not in the high-risk category are being asked to take care of themselves, as my colleague Min Jung mentioned earlier. How do you respond to this shift? Well, I personally generally welcome the general direction of uh, what's going to change. Uh, I also think that we need to focus primarily on the more vulnerable people, who obviously would be the people of elderly ages or people with uh, underlying diseases, heavy underlying diseases, that is. But I kind of question as to how hastily this was done, uh, because it seems like those people who will now be covered with oral pills uh, the age groups of it does not necessarily match who are uh, to be taken care at home because we're uh, uh, setting the age limit to those uh, to be cared at home to be 60 and above, but yet are planning to give the oral pills to 50 and above. I personally think that the at home treatment should also be applied to 50 and above who with underlying diseases and even to those people who need uh, very close monitoring, such as people with congenital disease or, or uh, uh, bed ridden patients and whatnot. So um, even though I do um, um, agree with the general idea of what the government government is uh, directing. Uh, I also uh, uh, feel that the government is kind of um, doing this so by the minute, as opposed to planning ahead, uh, uh, assuring the general population that they are completely taking care of what should be handled. So I think hopefully in the near future, the government will be able to come out more clearly uh, in its explanation of why they're taking these steps and also what could be done by the population to better handle the situation, such as that for, uh, as Professor Kim mentioned, uh, for those people who are currently contained at home, who are to be taken care of, of themselves, they do not have a clear idea what to do with the disease. If they're to be sick, it's, it's a general um, guidance that they are to call the general clinic. But what could the general clinic do for them other than contacting the, the government uh, um, officials or, or, or the health clinics? So, uh, I, and I personally don't think that the general clinics even have a clearest idea on how to handle the general patients. So I think um, it, it should be more efficiently done so as, a, 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 as in planning the protocol or explaining to the general population why they're doing this, the purpose of this steps and so on, so that the people could understand what they can do for themselves in, uh, among the taking this, uh, of the steps, uh, not only for them uh, treating for themselves, but also for those people who need uh, treatment from higher up um, medical facilities. Right. And keeping in mind the concerns raised by Prof Professor Kwak, Professor Kim, what do you recommend to ensure an effective at-home treatment campaign? Um, I think most of the young people will be okay. They will be okay staying home. But uh, you have to know uh, where you can contact uh, the clinics that's uh, seeing the patients, confirm patients, and you might have to know the phone numbers. You can contact during daytime and also during the nighttime. And uh, if, the, if you are getting worse, like a high fever or chest discomfort or dyspnea, you have to call them. But um, uh, I think uh, there's a small device called oximetry, which checks the uh, saturation, uh, oxygen saturation of, uh, from your finger. I think people might need that. Uh, I think there's a kit and it is included in it, but uh, some people who is not uh, getting that kit might have to prepare by themselves. And uh, you have to install the uh, application in your mobile phone and uh, give answers to the symptoms you have. There are some medications like uh, Tylenol, some antipyretics, which might be necessary. And some physicians recommend vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, but as an only minor effect. Usually, I will recommend that kind of uh, medications for people who are not sick yet, yet but exposed to uh, confirmed patients as a family member or something. And. Uh, the most important thing I would recommend is hydration. You have to keep yourself hydrated. Uh, you have to drink more water than uh, usual times, unless you have some kidney problems. And you can check it by urination. Should be plenty and should be very uh, should not be uh, yellow colored or uh, dark colored.
Right, and staying with medication, Professor Kwak, as you mentioned, the expanded use of Paxlova to include all those age 50 and above, what are some things to bear in mind? Well, so this disease seems to have preferences in the what, uh, what kinds of underlying diseases that they target. It seems like people, even in younger age groups, um, people who suddenly turn severe or possibly even die from the disease tend to be either obese or have diabetes or have conditions that affect the brain that they're taking heavy medicines uh, to keep um, uh, from having seizures. So those people who are taking those medications should be clearly aware of what kind of medications they're currently taking because Paxlovid is a medicine that takes a huge toll in the liver function. Uh, two parts to the medication. One part actually is a liver function decreasing agent to elongate the effect of the other. So which means that it's intentionally decreasing the metabolism, metabolism through liver. That being said, people who are taking medications that are also uh, metabolized through liver should be clearly aware just in case that they, they get infected so that they could tell the appropriate doctors to make decisions on whether or not to uh, be given the Paxlovid or to be even not be given Paxlovid because in very rare cases, people who are taking, let's say, anti-seizure medication should not be given Paxlovid at all. Those are people who are contraindicated, so to speak. So uh, people who are currently taking these certain medication, uh, they need to go through these, each medication and see if they would be meta uh, liver metabolized, number one. Number two, they should be able to tell their doctors once if they get infected that they are taking certain medications. Right, I see. Moving forward, Professor Kim, the academic arena has been granted authority with regard to learning amid Omicron and also the handling of infections within its grounds. What are your thoughts on this autonomous arrangement? They announced that the, uh, they're going to follow a 315 rule, which means 3% of students infected or 15% of infected or quarantined is reached. You, you, can, uh, uh, when, uh, you can stop a school. But uh, I would like to quote from uh, Little Prince. It says that what is essential is invisible to the eye. So I mean, there are going to be a lot of asymptomatic uh, students. And uh, there's a small study from uh, M Imperial College London. They uh, did a COVID-19 human challenge trial, including 36 uh, candidates. and. Uh, about half of them were infected, but there were some uh, few numbers had a, a asymptomatic infections also. So uh, I think school needs to keep that strict rules of social distancing inside class, uh, wearing masks and hand washing and disinfected uh, toilets and everything. And I'm a little bit worried about the uh, quality control of PCR test if it's done at school. And uh, each school has to decide whether uh, what kind of decision they're going to make. It's going to be a big burden and cause a lot of confusion for the students and the parents. So I think it's going to need upgrade uh, their st strategy soon. Right, and staying with schools and the concerns this time raised by Professor Kim. Professor Kwok, what do you propose to allow for a safe learning environment as schools embrace uh, this new health responsibility? Well, number one is boosting up the vaccination rate, obviously. And as I've said before, I think Korea, uh, Korea government should uh, uh, expedite the process to allow children of ages between 5 to 11 to be allowed to receive um, COVID-19 vaccine because there are a certain group of children who are congenitally diseased who are more prone to having it more severe. Those people still need this vaccination. So, but not only for those people who are to about, about to attend um, schools as well, some people Obviously, children would be much better protected through vaccination, even if it's not mandated. So we need to boost up the vaccination rate, number, four, number one. Number two, as I iterate all the time, it's ventilation. It's physical aspect that also has huge impact on the transmission of virus. So even your, if you are at school, open up the windows and keep it open all the time. But also, if you can, take all or almost all kinds of activities outside. That way, it, uh, it's, it'll be much lesser chance for the virus to transmit to others, keeping the children safe as well. Right. So seek to vaccinate if you can, keep windows open, mm -hmm. and seek to keep activities outdoors. Yes. Right. Professor Clark, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts. Professor Kim, thank you for your thoughts as well. Thank you.